welcome all those on Facebook to our evening session on the Psalms. Please let us know who's out there, so post in the comments to identify yourself if you can. It helps us know who, who's participating with us. Okay, so here we have Andrew, Forrest, and Kathy, and myself. So last week we covered the Psalm 103. And what was the kind of lesson we had from that? Anyone <laughs> remember? It's about creation. And what about it's creation? About creation. Uh, that uh, God is the uh, uh, provider of all things and that creation all works together in, in his might. That everything was created for a purpose, and, and uh, it all works together. You know, the wonder and awe. We need to give thanks for everything that God has created for us. But I wonder if I'm set up here to get the comments. You think about it, it amazes you how it just synchronizes. I think so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hope is here. Okay, I hope. Welcome. We got one. I see the other comments now are showing. All right, great. Tonight, we're going to cover Psalm 140 or 141, depending on how you number them, either the Septuagint or the Hebrew Bible. And if you all have a copy of, uh, of the commentaries, if not, if you let me know, I can email anyone who just tuned in. And we can have Forrest here can e email you a copy of it. Good to uh, if we have your email address, that is. Nancy, welcome. How are you? Good to see you here. Welcome. Okay, so tonight we're only going to use Facebook. Last week we tried using Facebook and Skype to try to get some participation. And. Uh, and Forrest is trying experimenting with another system that he says Marla uses a lot. Hello, Carmen, welcome. Jim, welcome. Hello. Stefanos. Oh, is that Jamie? Can you guys hear me? Oh, that's Marla. Hey, Marla. Hello, Cindy and Charlie. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Hi, Marla. I'll turn my video on. So there yeah. we go. So Forrest is experimenting with something called Zoom, which we need to have your email address to talk you into. So next week, we'll probably try to using that and see how that works out, because it allows for voice back and forth like a, like a regular dialogue. So we can all have a regular dialogue rather than just posting, posting comments. So um, at the end of our session, make sure we have your email address or mail it to me. I put my email Hi, address. Marla up there on the screen so you can just email me your email address to make sure I have it if you don't think I, I have it next week uh, when it gets this time we'll invite you to come to Zoom and what to, to sign into Zoom they, is it, it's very simple right? Oh yeah I send out an email or a message or an email uh, and all they do is press on the link and it'll bring it up. Okay so it's real simple. Oh, once we have you, you, have you email. Hello who's this? It's Marla. Yeah, we hey, got Marla. Marla's here too. Hey Marla, I'm gonna go to just yes. just audio if that's okay, just so it's less um, da data. Okay, we need a request here for the uh, the commentary. Can you mail your copy that you put together to uh, Nancy? Do you have what is it? Six one zero eight three. Nancy six one zero eight three at hotmail dot com. Six one zero eight three at hotmail. Okay. They want the sound up, so that means we probably maybe can move the mic down a little bit here, uh, so we don't have maybe a good microphone system. Uh, so we'll, but you guys are going to have to speak into this side. Uh, otherwise, you're speaking into the back of the mic. Okay. Okay. So I don't know if we can get any better. Is that any better if we speak like this? Is that uh, better volume? We'll try. It. We'll try it. Okay, so let's let's begin. Uh, 
Make sure you use Facebook there to add your comments as we go along so we do have some um, participation, if you will. Andrew, you might want to move down to this chair too so you're speaking uh, into the mic rather than the back of the mic there. Okay, Bobby. Okay, we'll start with a... Uh, 61083 at Hotmail. 61083 at Hotmail.com, yeah. Okay. Okay, it should be on its way. Yeah, no, it said it failed to send. Let's try another one. Oh, Capital Mike says yes on the sound. Okay, good. I'll try to speak up. Holler if I don't. So I tend to have a soft voice to begin with, so I used to have to be reminded to speak up a little bit. Okay, let's start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us pray. Shine with our hearts, O loving Master, with the pure light of your divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your psalms. Instill us also in the reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having conquered all sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual life, thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, our God, are the light of our souls and bodies, and to you we give glory. You, the Father, your Son, who is without beginning, you're our holy, good, and life-giving Spirit, now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. And that is the basic prayer that St. John Chrysostom has given to us to be said before we read the Scripture. Okay, so we'll begin with the commentary on Psalm 140. And Andrew, do you want to read carefully and fairly slowly the psalm itself, the complete psalm, so we can all just kind of reflect on it before we begin to go into the details of it? Gladly. Psalm 140. O Lord, I have cried to you. Hear me. Give heed to the voice of my supplication when I cry to you. Let my prayer set forth before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, a door of enclosure about my lips. Incline not my heart to evil words, to make excuses and sins with men who work lawlessness, and I will not join their choice ones. The righteous man shall correct me, with mercy he shall reprove me. But let not the oil of the sinner anoint my head, for my prayer shall be incense in the presence of their pleasures. Their judges are swallowed up by the rock, they shall hear my words, for they are pleasant. As a clod of ground is dashed to pieces on the earth, so our bones were scattered beside the grave. For my eyes, O Lord, O Lord, are toward you. In you I hope. Take not my soul away. Keep me from the snares they set for me, and from the stumbling blocks of those who work lawlessness. Sinners shall fall into their own net. I am alone until I escape. Okay, there's lots of lessons in this psalm here, so it'll be a little different than last time, which is more about creation. This is really has a lot of implications about our prayer life, and our, we get other lessons from St. John Chrysostom as well. And we have lots of saints that have, have commented on this, so we have a variety here tonight too as well. Okay, the Orthodox Study Bible starts off with just a little summary. It says... This is the psalm of the evening incense. It's the one that's the one that the chanters all like to love to sing in our Vesper service, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. are, are you prepared to sing it tonight? Well, sure. Which tone would you like it in? <laughs> Which <laughs> tone? That old joke. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like I, I say when Kathy asks me, what would you like to eat tonight? I don't care. It just gets me something good. That's funny. Okay, and I also said the incense is a visible sign of our prayers of all God's people. Incense has been used in the church from its very beginning and long before that in the, in the Jewish faith as well. So Forrest, why don't you give us a little rendition as you would present. Oh, you're kidding, right? I was, I thought, singing it? Yeah. <laughs> They've all heard me sing it before, right? No, I don't think so. So yeah. we'd um, love to hear you chant. <clears throat> Let's see. You can't do it from memory? Um, I prefer not to do it from oh, memory. Okay, that's okay. You so hang on a second. You can English look up or Greek? Uh, hmm? English or Greek? Let's do it in English. Okay. Is that okay, English, everyone? It's better for me, I know. Na, na, na. Lord, I have cried unto
Okay, very nice. Thank it's you. It's beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. So do the other verses get get sung That's as well normally? That's beautiful. Thank you, sweetie. Do uh, the other verses get sung as well normally? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it, once it gets to the set, O Lord, a watch, those go more quickly. Okay. All right. So let's go on. Let's go on with the commentary. And this is also, of course, when the uh, we sense the church at this time too, when they talk about the incense, when that verse comes up, is when uh, the deacon begins sensing sensing the church in the vesper service. Okay, uh, St. John Chrysostom tells us, and he says, they prescribed, prescribed its recital as a kind of saving medicine and cleansing of sins, so that whatever stain that we uh, have had during the day, uh, all, whether it's at home or wherever, we uh, might, on coming of the evening, get rid of it. Uh, through a spiritual air. So it's a very uh, significant uh, psalm in this sense, designed for to help us cleanse ourselves from the sins of the day. So that's why it's put in our evening services. And the uh, Jewish uh, Psalter, Kehilim, uh, says this psalm teaches an important lesson that we should pray for the divine assistance that our mouths not speak what is not in our hearts. That probably gives us a little thought, right? <laughs> the gatekeeper only allows the gate to be open for a good purpose. Let it be the same with our lips. And we'll see, St. John Chrysostom will come back to this fairly, and a couple of the other commentators uh, with vengeance, as you will see, as a, maybe one of the lessons from this, uh, this song. Okay, verse one. O Lord, I have cried to you. Hear me. Give heed to the voice of my supplication when I cry out to you. So Chrysostom asked the question, why does the psalmist say I cry to you? Why is he using that terminology? Thoughts? Well, we can read what John Chrysostom <laughs> says, okay? Since no one's willing to venture their own thoughts yeah. on that. And maybe it's not any different than what, what he says. He says, in other words, just as one shouts, exhausts all energy, so too one shouting in the heart gathers together all powers of the thought. In other words, our crying to the Lord is like a way of concentrating our energy and directing it to, to the Lord. Um, so then that, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So it's not just saying a prayer, dear Lord, or our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, but cry, a crying out with our prayer in a very uh, purposeful and uh, with lots of energy is something that uh, they're saying, is the psalmist is calling us to. And Chrysostom also makes the comment, says, many standing for prayer who do not raise their shouting to God. He says, while their lips shout to God and bandy about God's name, the mind of none of them is attuned to the words. So I don't know if anyone's like me, but I find this problem quite frequently, that I can be praying, and then all of a sudden my mind is going somewhere totally different. Is this an issue anyone else has? For me, Deacon. For me, yes. Everyone here raises their hand. <laughs> oh, I, I, I have perfect concentration when I pray. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, Marla says she has no difficulty no, that's whatsoever. That's true of all of us. Jamie's I, here, too. too. <laughs> Jamie joined in, Deacon. Okay, so welcome, Jamie. <laughs> so it is a common problem, isn't it? So again, that calls for why we should cry out, right? Because when we're crying out, what do we do when we get distracted like that? What are we taught to do? Bring ourselves back. Re refocus. Focus on the words and focus our attention and put some energy into it. Either maybe change the pace of your prayer, change your attitude towards, towards your prayer so you bring yourself concentrating on God. Because they say <laughs> a prayer that isn't concentrated on God is not a prayer. So when you have that distraction, you're no longer praying, even though you're saying 
the words of the prayer. Okay, and later on he says in the second paragraph, he says, so we all know the lesson from that first point, right? He says, you're praying not against your enemies. So he's kind of giving us an idea of what we pray for, or what we don't pray for in this sense. You're praying not against your enemies, nor for wealth or material advantage. Not for influence and reputation, not for anything passing, but to those unending and immortal things. Don't we tend to come, uh, pray for those things that we want for this material life? For those unending and immortal things, he says. Sake the kingdom of God. Scripture says, remember, and all things will be given to you in my crying out to you. Do you see how he wishes us to call with zeal and with enthusiasm? So it's not just with the energy, it's also having the right topic for prayer, um, which is why we always advise people to use the prayers of the church. Because when you use those written prayers, they keep you from having basically self-centered prayers. Uh, not that they're they, not all that bad, but they're not necessarily that good in terms of what your ultimate goal is. What is the ultimate goal? You just said it here, right? Seek the kingdom of God, that we want to be with him uh, with eternal life. Chrysostom used to do this in his preaching, too. He would see that the people were eager to hear what he was saying. He would give them more. Mm -hmm. He would go deeper, but if they were kind of dull of hearing, he would just wrap it up and move on. And he leave, right? <laughs> I have said enough. <laughs> See you tomorrow, right? Hard to believe it since he always uh, talked with so many words. And he also goes on and says, Imitate the apostles. They suffered countless calamities. Surely they did not say, Squash them or kill them. Do you see prayer characterized by sound values, demanding no punishment of enemies despite such calamities? We see that in all the lives of the saints too, don't we? Not only in the Christ and the apostles, but in the, in the uh, martyrs of the church. Okay, let's go to the next verse. It says, let my prayer be set forth before you as incense, which this prayer gets its name from this uh, verse, actually. The lifting up of my hands as an e evening sacrifice. So we're setting our prayers as incense and lifting up our hands in the evening sacrifice. So I think the both the, many of the commentators here tried to explain to us the context of this, which comes from uh, the basic, the Jewish practice of ancient times uh, about the evening sacrifice. And I'll just read, maybe, uh, Forrest, do you want to read this uh, commentary of Chrysostom in olden times? Start there and read, read the rest of it. Sure. Um, in olden times, there were two altars, one made of bronze and the other of gold. The former was public and accessible, available for the victims of the whole assembly. Other removed in the inner sanctum and behind the veil. In the outside altar, um, each evening a lamb was offered and burnt. It was called the evening sacrifice, and twice a day the altar had to be lit in the temple, besides other victims offered by the people. This was an obligation for the priests, so that in the event of no one that no one had offered yet, in a house and automatically morning and evening a lamb would be sacrificed and burnt. This had been legislated by God indicating through this happening that there was need to worship him constantly at the beginning and the end of the day. The kind of offering was sometimes acceptable, sometimes unacceptable, depending on the disposition of the offers in terms of virtue or vice. Whereas what was offered not for the sins of others but was a requirement of law, and a ritual of worship was acceptable in every case. The psalmist therefore asked for his prayer to become uh, like that sacrifice defiled by no blemish of the altar, like pure and holy incense. He is asking us to offer prayers that are pure and fragrant. The incense, even if itself is fine and sweet-smelling, but gives particular evidence of its fragrance at the time when it is mixed with fire. So too is prayer fine of itself, but becomes finer and more sweet-smelling when offered with ardor and glowing spirit, when the soul become a censer and light, a burning of fire. 
the incense should not be added unless the, I don't know how to say that word, brazier, mm -hmm. um, had been previously lit. Do likewise with your own mind. First light it with enthusiasm and then offer your prayers. I think it's kind of interesting this, hmm. not only the fact of the evening sacrifice, so why that terminology we have from the past, but the, this parallel he's made with the, the, sense, the incense and the censer, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That the idea of prayer is sweet smelling, right? Pure and fragrant. Um, and that it's like, uh, we should be like the sensor. We first have to light a sensor. We have to light the charcoal first, right? Get the fire going. And then we put the incense on it. Then it gives off this fragrant smell. So same thing about preparing for prayer, getting that energy focused on God and then offering our, our sweet incense to God and either thanksgiving or asking for his help to overcome our passions and difficulties to become like him. So it kind of means it takes time to get ready for prayer. You can't just show up and start saying the words. You need to get there yeah. early and or you, there has to be some kind of preparation. It has to be some kind of yeah, ritual. focus, right, that you do for yourself, yeah. For some it may be more or less Saint Theophan, I think, used to say, you, uh, maybe you should do some prostrations before you start. Uh, something that calms yourself and focuses you. Lighting the candle, lighting some incense, mm -hmm. even uh, that is another good good way to develop that concentration. So that as you start your prayer, you're reading the prayers normally, that you're doing it from the heart with energy and with uh, fervor. Do you find? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Okay. Well, I'm curious when they had the sacrificial lamb, that when they had the lamb that they burned on the altar, how did that transfer to incense? incense. Yeah. Well, they offered incense as well. Yeah, did, they did they at both. the same time? Mm -hmm. They did both. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wasn't sure about that. They required to do reading both. This. I often think about like in the Orthodox Church, you have, you know, you have chanting, Father, Father Tom and Father Zach are talking about to the kids, how the senses are used in worship. And so I think these, the senses being kind of engaged, so when you come into church and you smell incense, you hear chanting, you see the, the, the beautiful icons, that all of those kind of act in like a spiritual mnemonic mm -hmm. that kind of draw you and help you focus more quickly because it typically takes me a long time to settle my inside down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a reason we do all the the bells and whistles, as they right. call it, often, <laughs> that they make Something. people that make fun of us, so to speak. Okay, the next question that Chrysostom raises is, "What is the meaning of lifting up the hands?" Have you thought of that? He says, "Since the hands administer to many wicked actions, that we lift them up so that the ministry of prayer may prove a containment of these very vices." And freedom from evil. So I guess it's like a surrender, right? When you, that's what you do when you surrender. You lift your hands up, right? And the, the cop comes to get you, right? Yeah. Ask our, uh, <laughs> our, yeah. our uh, uh, service man here, <laughs> Andrew, that the first thing you do. So that's what we're doing. That we're kind of surrendering, we're offering ourselves to surrender, give up these hands that do evil, uh, to only be blessed and good in your in your name. Maybe to get God's attention too. I mean, your hands up will get more attention than just yes, standing possibly, like that. Possibly, yes. So do any of you pray with your hands up? I don't tend to do that myself. I don't tend no, to do that either. either. There might be a practice to, it. to experience. Yeah, but the Virgin Mary, right? The icon in the church, her hands yeah. are up. Yes. Right, right, right. That is the traditional uh, position for prayer, yeah. So I'm self-conscious and probably a little lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a little more than a little. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe this will give us some uh, motivation to add more uh, zest to our prayer, right? Have a brighter, hotter charcoal burning when we pray. Okay, St. John Cassian gives us another thought. He says, uh, someone offers that they, they do. I, didn't, uh, I don't know who, I can't tell. But anyway, so one of the people on Facebook says they, they practice that way. That's very good. So John Cassian says, <laughs> we understand in still more spiritual sense that the true evening sacrifice is what was given by the Lord 
our Savior in the evening to the apostles at the supper when he instituted the holy mysteries of the church and what he himself on the following day at the end of the ages offered up to the Father by the lifting his hands up for the salvation of the whole world. So you see, some of the fathers will take this to a higher level, right? And relate it to our, our uh, divine liturgy and our, our Eucharist as we go through here. Okay, let's see what uh, Father Reardon has a comment, looking at this second paragraph there. Andrew, you want to read that? The Rising of Incense? Sure. Start at the Rising of Incense. Mm -hmm. The rising incense smoke as symbolic of prayer is most vividly portrayed in the vision of the heavenly throne room in Revelation. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. Well, you can see this use of incense is rather fully integrated into the prayer of before the time of Christ and uh, afterwards. Okay, let's go to the third voice, verse. Excuse me. Um, the third verse says, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Here we come to the, the little moral teaching here. The door of enclosure about my lips. So what do you think Chrysostom is going to tell us? He's never shy about giving us moral direction. <laughs> he says, Neither tongue nor mouth is of any avail unless reason is entrusted with the task of closing and opening with precision the understanding and the knowledge of what must be put out and what must be kept in. Let us guard our mouth constantly, set reason on it to close it, not for it to be constantly closed, but for it to open appropriately in season. There are times when silence is of more value than speech, as likewise speech is more than silence. Paul also says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so as to know how to answer each and every one. And this is the reason that Christ said, every idle word that people speak, they will give on account of. And Paul also says, let no foul speech issue from your mouth. So what are some of the issues about controlling our mouths? We're not good at it. <laughs> <laughs> it no works gets, faster than the brain. <laughs> no one gets angry here. We all saints here. It uh, it it makes it harder for you to minister to people if if they have memories of you saying bad things to them or saying bad things about somebody around them. Yeah. And. I find it that if you say something bad to a person or around a person, it makes that grow. Whereas if you suppress it, it, it doesn't grow inside of you as much as it does if you mm -hmm. vent it. Mm -hmm. Very true. So this is a problem of our age, right? It seems to me our, our tongues and mouths have become very loose. And people are very not very careful about what they say and when they say it and how they say it. So it gives us all a challenge. I think we got a comment. It says, James says, the tongue is a restless evil. Guarding our mouths is very difficult. I sure agree. I sure agree. This is a big challenge for all of us, isn't it? Okay. How about this idea of silence? Well, they say silence is golden. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps you out of trouble. Okay, Chrysostom says, there are many ways to destruction through the mouth, such as when someone is obscene, uh, ribald, vainglorious, boastful, like the Pharisee. If on the other hand, you want to hear of some people perishing through inappropriate silence, I shall show you, he says. If you have not warned the people, scripture says, remember, while they will die in their sin, their blood I shall require at your hand. So there are times we need to speak up, right? 
to interact in uh, when there is sinful things, evil taking place to counteract it. So it isn't always appropriate for us just to remain silent. I think later on here it says something that some of us may be better capable of actually interacting. Other of us may not have the capability, so what we need to do is to avoid those situations where we will run into the sinfulness. So depending on where our strengths are, uh, different paths may be appropriate for us. Well, have you ever noticed that certain people bring out certain feelings in you? Some of them are not always good, so sometimes it's better to be standoffish, mm -hmm. not yeah. participate with them for a while. So I would say probably for most of us, avoiding situations where we find that we get into conditions where we can't control our mouths, <laughs> where we're made angry or whatever, uh, that we, we avoid it. I know like on Facebook, uh, some of these statements that have no truth on them, that inspire hatred, I just, it makes me angry. So I have to, in those instances, it's like pause for 30 days. There's a key on Facebook, you can pause for 30 days. So I don't have to be brought to that in my mind with those things, kind of a way of avoiding it. Uh, my experience is to interact on those things does not lead to anything good. <laughs> so I don't have that skill. Okay, Theodoret has also a commentary. Kathy, you want to read what he says? Start from the beginning, the creators? Surely, it's a, oh, it's a, the creators, oh. yeah. Anyway. The creators gave two walls to the tongue, one of teeth and the other of lips, to check the irrational impulses. Nevertheless, the inspired author begs to enjoy other guards as well. Afraid, least he utter something improper while lamenting his lot. In fact, history witnesses to the fact that even when pursued by Saul, he could not bring himself to say anything blasphemous at all. Instead, when they were trying to kill Saul, David referred to him as the Lord's anointed, and in, address, in addressing him, he called himself his servant. And the one who reported his death, bragging he had done it, he dispatched in the words, your blood be on your head, for claiming to have done away with the Lord, Lord's anointed. Yeah, David has, gives us such good examples of how to deal with an enemy, doesn't he? So in that way, he constantly mirroring the, uh, the way of Christ, who is also that way. Okay, let's, how about St. Augustine here? My note here says, raises the bar. Let's see what I mean. There are many things that we do not speak from the mouth. Oh, okay. This is going about, we have an inner voice too, right? We do not speak from the mouth of the body, but shout from the heart. Yet no word of anything proceeds from the mouth of that body in whose heart there is silence. Thus, whatever is done emanate from there does not sound outside, but what does emanate from there, if it is evil, even though it does not move the tongue, defiles the soul. The continence, therefore, must be placed where the conscience, even of those who are outwardly silent, speak. And he continues this in the next verse. So let's read the next verse. Incline not my heart to evil words. So we're going from the voice to the heart. To make excuses and sins with mean men who work lawlessness. And I will not join with their choice ones. Forrest, you want to read this comment <coughs> by Augustine? Kind of sure. continue what he said earlier. This inclination of the heart, what is it if not consent? For he has not yet spoken who has not yet consented by an inclination of the heart to the onrushing suggestion, suggestions in his heart of any act whatsoever. If, however, he consented, he has already spoken in his heart even though he has not made a sound with his mouth. Even though he has not 
done the deed with his hand or any other part of his body, he has committed it because he has determined in his mind to do it, and he is guilty of the act. By the laws of God, even though it remains concealed from the sight of people, the word being spoken in the heart, though no act be committed in the body. So what do you think about this? Hmm. Jamie, what's your thought? Marla? Still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Thinking, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, this raises the bar really high, doesn't it? So this is like Jesus. Jesus says, you know, if you, uh, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. If you're, if, you, if you're angry and yell at your brother, you've committed murder. Um, which which uh, shows us that we're all, we're all breaking the commandments of God constantly because we can't keep those things in check. Mm -hmm. Even though we might be able to hide it on the surface. Um, uh, but I have to also think that if we can hide it on the surface and hold our tongue, it's better. <laughs> it's better than to... Well, so talk later. That's the starting point, right? Yeah. It's the beginning point. That that can check us. Uh, but we continue. can do better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, let's just know that we have <laughs> yeah. to control what's in the heart, right? So at least we can... If we can at least we have the conscience to speak out about it. We know that there's something in our heart that we've got to correct and get cured mm -hmm. right? but like Andrew said uh, you know if you if you let the cat out of the bag so to speak it gets really big really quickly but if you can hold it in it kind of smolders it mm -hmm. exactly so it's a way to stifle what's in our heart isn't it by speaking properly okay Jerome says let not my heart incline to evil words to make excuses and sins oh unhappy race of human beings we seek excuse for sin by saying, nature got the better of me. Who was a comedian that used to say, God, or the uh, devil made me do it? What was his name? That's probably too old. The for Jackie Gleason or somebody? No. <laughs> we are <laughs> always <laughs> justifying ourselves and saying, I did not want to sin, but lust overwhelmed me. And we ought to be doing penance and crying, Lord, I have sinned. We excuse ourselves instead and yoke sins to us. Apostle Paul says, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and make me prisoner to the law of sin that is in my members. And again he says, But I chastise my body and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps after preaching to others I myself should be rejected. And later he says, Unhappy man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? We all have our own struggles, and therefore it is, un it is in proportion to his struggles that each one receives his reward. And this is a message that's also constantly given to us by St. Paisios, that God knows that we struggle. He knows we all start with different sets of conditions. Some of us are in conditions that are very difficult. So some of us are going to be able to do things more like Christ than others. And God's going to know this. And so we have to remember that we, all we can continue to do is give our best effort to uh, controlling what's in our heart as an example. Any other excuses that we know for, that we give ourselves for our sinfulness? I mean, we all live according to, in lives that are uh, and not according to, to Scripture with the, with the abundance of resources that we use and live in and um, compared to what we're we all, all we all make excuses so what how do we well, make I, what excuses do we I make i think that we we blame other people for our anger and our sin like we think well if this person just acted righteously or this way or that way um like i didn't want to get angry but it, it's shifting the blame instead of taking responsibility mm-hmm mm -hmm easy to do right mm -hmm. i agree and i think oh, that yeah. we we not only put the the blame on the cause but also on the effect sometimes we can say um this person had it coming to him or, or something like that you know what i mean that that yeah. what we did was justified because we justify our anger right we call it righteousness right <laughs> righteous anger. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Now, Chris mm-hmm. raised a question we brought up earlier. He says, why does he put things in reverse order, coming to the heart after first speaking of the mouth? It's a pretty good question, right? Why do you start with the heart? He says, let the doors be closed and the evil thoughts will quick, quickly be subdued. So in other words, if we can have the will to close the mouth, and we can subdue what's uh, percolating in our hearts. Make sense? Okay, That's also where ask, patience comes in again, right? Yeah. Use your patience and think about yeah, it before really just virtue. reacting, reacting. <laughs> Which is else. hard for Greeks to do. This Greek, anyway. <laughs> Not just Greeks. Believe me. <laughs> What are the words of wickedness? He asked, which is also in this verse. He says, many and varied, those that each plots, traduce, or slander, speaking badly of God, repel virtue, pursue vice, words cheerfully listened to, incorrupt teachings, and careless living, and the like proceed from deep wickedness. So none of us are wicked, are we? Really? He I says, can think of a few people. <laughs> yeah, other people, right? <laughs> it's not here. So, I got it. Not here. <laughs> oh, me. Lust is responsible. Evil through sinning is denying it after making is it after making after sinning makes it worse. In other words, if we do deny it and make up excuses, it makes the sin worse. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a weapon of the devil, he says. It happened also with the first human beings, right? Adam and Eve. What did they do after, when they uh, disobeyed God? Adam, she made me do it. Adam blames Eve, Eve, and Eve, Eve blames the, the snake. snake. <laughs> now don't took responsibility for their sin. As a result, they were thrown out of paradise to live the life as we struggle with here, with our mortal bodies, suffering with pain and sickness and death. Okay, what time we got here? Okay, we better move on here if we're going to make it through here, right? The next verse. The righteous man shall correct me with mercy, and he shall reprove me. Okay, so he's asking here, to be helped, right, with the, from the righteous man. Jerome says, if I do wrong and you wish to correct me, accuse me openly of my fault and not backbite me secretly. Let the righteous smite me and it shall be a kindness and let him reprove me. But let not the oil of the sinner enrich my head. For what does the apostle say? Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son who he receives. So I guess this is saying we should look for those that we have know to be uh, righteousness, have righteousness to uh, encourage them to correct us of what they see in us, right? That that can be very helpful to us when it's coming from the right uh, attitude and position. Let's see. That He's can be really hard to do. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. very well, hard, right? Correct. Yeah, because we don't want to admit that we have anything wrong, don't we, generally? That's the same problem we have with confession, isn't it? Well, we resist going to confession, too. And we don't want to admit to God, <laughs> even though he knows everything, uh, let alone with a priest listening to us. You may, without my knowledge of it, wound someone else by the narration of my sins, or rather of those which you slanderously attribute to me. And while you're eager to spread the news in all quarters, talking about someone that's not doing it properly, you may pretend to confide in each individual as though you had spoken to no one else. So this is the slander or the talking about others. That is very difficult. You have a comment? Amanda. Hey, Amanda. And Dan's both here too. Yeah. Welcome. It's easier to be negatively reactive than positively reactive. 
Boy, isn't that the truth? Thank you, Amanda. So what do we do about it? How do we go over this? I guess by recognizing this, right? We say this out loud to each of us. We recognize the things that we need to focus and work on and ask others maybe to help. What he's saying here, help, ask others to help us. Uh, this voice is asking us to feel, seek this kind of input out. Theodoret, in the next verse, the judges are swallowed up by the rock. This one maybe is a little symbolic, I think. They shall hear my words, for they are pleasant. Theodoret explains this verse by saying, Within a short time, he is saying, they will be no more, and those clinging to the pinnacle of influence will be like drowning people of influence, clinging to the tips of water submerged by water. In other words, they will be consigned to oblivion, and learning by experience of my words, they will also feel their sweetness and benefit. Nice thought, huh? Any other thoughts on that verse? Let's move on. I don't see any other comments. Somehow, let's see, I gotta scroll up on this. There we go. Verse 7. As a clod of ground is dashed to pieces on the earth, so our bones were scattered beside the grave. And here we have to be like a farmer. We realize what it's like to, to plow up a field, right? And the clods that uh, we, as we break up the earth. Chrysostom says, despite our suffering extreme hardship, being all scattered and ruined like soil that is herald, plagued and dug and arriving at the very gates of death, yet in spite of this condition, we prefer instruction and correction from the righteous to mercy from sinners. Whatever happened after all, we depended on hope in you and would never be dissuaded from looking to you. Okay. Verse 10, anyone for verse 10? And this will bring us to the end and we can have general any general discussion. Some tough lessons, right? Coming out from this psalm. Mm -hmm. Verse 10 says, Sinners shall fall into their own net. I am alone until I escape. Who wants to read this commentary? Andrew? Sure. Would you like me to read uh, Chrysostom? Mm -hmm. Okay. Whose net will they fall into? God's very own. That is to say, they will be snared, they will be caught, the righteous, to the point of correction and awakening their sound values. Sinners suffering incurable ailments as they are, as they are, to the point of punishment and, re and retribution. I am on my own until I pass on or escape. This is security, this protection, this growth in virtue, shunning the wicked, being self-collected and disciplined for the whole of life, and dwelling by oneself away from those who corrupt. Isolation does not constitute being alone, note, but an attitude of sound values. In this way, people who live in the middle of cities with their tumult and business can be on their own by shunning the corrupt gatherings and devote themselves to the assemblies of the righteous. This is the safe way. Consequently, let the person who is capable of correcting others associate with the likely to attempt the treatment and make them better. Let the one who is laxer, on the other hand, shun the wicked so as not to contract harm from them. In this way, they will also live the present life safely and gain the future of good things. So how about this practice of shunning the corrupt gatherings? How do we practice this? What is our modern day kind of issue that we how we can practice it, or maybe how we fail to practice it. Either way, whatever experiences we have, it's probably a pretty important strategy, right? 
What does that mean in your lives? For me, being young, it, it means what kind of social gatherings I go to, right? I'm in college and then also in the military, and not to say anything bad about the military, but you have people from all different lives, people who do and don't have faith and people who have different morals. And you have to evaluate those things and what's gonna be happening before you decide to go somewhere. For me, being in my 20s. I think that's probably true everywhere. Social gatherings is mm -hmm. where a lot of sin takes place, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If we're not careful. Yeah, just who you associate with, with, who you spend your time around and who you listen to. That can even mean things like what you watch on TV and movies and mm. uh, because it all goes into your mind. Good thought. It's everywhere though, isn't it? This uh, impulses we get, right? It's not just movies or TV anymore, it's uh, on the internet. Yeah. All kinds of forms of things on the internet. We have that with us all the time. <laughs> right, we're carrying That's our pocket, sure. right? We got this <laughs> I mean, everywhere. These phones, and they give us alerts to things and we look at stuff and yeah, everywhere. These, these movable signs, these active signs that are out there, you know, the big advertisement signs and stuff. They've got all kinds of stuff on them now, too. Good, bad, and everything in between. So if it's a fast day and there's a big bash coming up with lots of drinking and singing and all that kind of stuff going on, who knows what else, what should we do? Is there a conflict between being social and following our way of life as an Orthodox Christian? Or is that just part of the struggle? What do you think? Any comments from you on Facebook? I struggle. I struggle with that because um, I think I think of like orthodoxy in its original context is you're surrounded by a community of people who are. Who are all sharing your same beliefs and your traditions and like I teach in a Catholic school and so our calendar is often really different and so I, I struggle with um, sort of being spending most of my time with people who are not on the same page and, and um, feeling kind of out of touch with Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like my work compartmentalizing, mm -hmm. you know, orthodoxy on Sunday and, you know, just kind of out there during the week. So, and I mean, I'm not talking about like mm -hmm. partying or anything like that. I'm too old for that. Ugh, um, come on. I, I didn't even do it. <laughs> we do have some bourbon in the cabinet. <laughs> what? I said we do bourbon. have some, oh, that was some bourbon. Shelby. Oh, we haven't opened it. I don't know. We have not opened, opened it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, that's not the temptation. Um, so that's got to be a difficult not, thing for you, right? That it, that's everybody so. that's orthodox. What? Right, Marla? That's what? everybody that's orthodox. I mean, I go to work. Um, no one at my work is orthodox. Um, and so, so uh, like you said, at, at church on Sunday, I'm around people that are... Uh, similar to me in my worldview uh, but even in even in our family life I mean my my mom's not my sisters aren't mm -hmm. this is what I think I face the biggest struggles when uh, like family visits and that sort of thing family's got a priority right but instead we have these other practices that we that keep us uh, balanced so to speak so it's easy to get unbalanced just like uh, we're having Christmas, we rotate Christmas and Thanksgiving. So Christmas will be at our house. Mm -hmm. My family does Christmas dinner uh, on Christmas Eve. Oh, yeah. And we have church. <laughs> and, and so, you know, so the question, you know, we'll probably eat. And then we can't partic participate in the liturgy uh, when we go to church. Uh, and so we're not really celebrating the birth of Christ the way that we should be. Sorry about that. Um, Phone call coming through. 
you know, kind of a real down to home, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So we all struggle with that, don't we? So that's why it's good to have groups like this, uh, spiritual gatherings, right? Of people that have the like minds uh, to share our, our difficulties and the struggles that we have. Because it is hard in this world, very difficult. But again, it reminds us, St. Theasios says, it reminds us that God knows how difficult conditions that we live in in these days. And I think I th think he used the example once where some woman was talking about her, worried about her children. And he says, look, my dear, in your days, what you would think of as a 10, today, if you got a 7, you're doing really good. So in other words, saying we have to recognize the difficult conditions that we find Get ourselves in, too. Perspective. And keep working at it, keep working at it, keep going, but not let it uh, defeat us, so to speak, and burden us. I want to lead towards our correction and finding those that are going to point out our weaknesses, those righteous, and avoiding those conditions where we can. But we can't avoid them all. We have to go to work. Um. Well, there's one big thing that I know a lot of the Orthodox ladies and groups have asked me and have concern about is going like to a wedding reception, a wedding and wedding reception Saturday, okay? And you dance and you eat and you have a glass of wine or whatever. And the next day you go to church and take communion. And that doesn't sit well with them. Well, of course, that's a misunderstanding too, because Saturday is not a fasting day; it's it's the uh, Sabbath, right? So I guess we should not be. I don't know. It's not the same thing as um, the church Carousing. gives us <laughs> gives us permission to celebrate on that day. Yeah, but doesn't that vary? Like uh, uh, Jacob's. Uh, godmother in California when she came here she said uh, she didn't receive communion on Sunday because we had gone out to dinner Saturday night and in her parish from 6 o'clock on mm. is, a, is when the fast begins so that's where you have to follow your spiritual father and uh, for most Greek Orthodox it's, it's from midnight is the way it's interpreted in the United States here <clears throat> but a different spiritual father might have a different direction for you too so we have to follow be obedient to whatever direction we get from our spiritual father that's true okay let's wind up by just reading through the psalm again and then uh, see if we have any different thoughts as we read through I'll read through it here so we have a comment anyone else having trouble connecting oh we got trouble with connections uh oh Oh, I'm so sorry. So I wonder if uh, Facebook, it's just itself. Maybe we got these two things going. We're on the same um, No, this, well, internet, this is right? on my phone. So it's going through the phone, not through the internet? Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh, he's running up our data. Oh, you know it, girl. So That's why I have you on audio. Anyone else having trouble connecting on Facebook? Anyone left? Because they couldn't connect, maybe, huh? Well, I, I, I didn't even try Facebook. I'm just on Zoom. So, hopefully we'll get some feedback on that. And we'll try, uh, next time we'll just try Zoom and see if that works better. Carmen says, anybody else having trouble connecting? So, someone says no. So, she must be. So, I'm good. <laughs> so that's good. Okay. Not everyone's having trouble anyway. Uh -uh. That's good to hear. So Deacon, it might also be good to have people um, that want to participate to send your um, their email to you where we can send this out so that they'll have a copy of it. They can print it out at their home. Yeah. I, I did those that were here last time. So those of you that are on uh, Facebook, um, email. I got the email address posted there on the uh, video. So send me an email and I will keep you posted on the next session, uh, which will be same time next Monday. Um, and I'll send you the commentary as well as uh, how we'll be holding it. Because I think we'll, we'll probably be contacting you through email to join Zoom. 
So maybe be available a few minutes before seven, like five minutes before seven, so we got time to uh, get everyone connected. And then hopefully we can have a, uh, a more of a dialogue uh, through this uh, Zoom uh, conferencing network. Okay, let me read the song, and then we'll say good night. O oh Lord, I have cried to you, hear me. Give heed to the voice of my supplication when I cry to you. Let my prayer be set forth before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, a door of enclosure about my lips. Incline not my heart unto evil words, to make excuses and sins with men who work lawlessness, and I will not join with their choice ones. The righteous man shall correct me with mercy, and he shall reprove me. But let not the oil of the sinner anoint my head, for my prayer shall be intense in the presence of their pleasure. Their judges are swallowed up by the rock. They shall hear my words, for they are pleasant. As a clod of ground is dashed to pieces on the earth, so our bones were scattered beside the grave. For my eyes, O Lord, O Lord, are towards you. In you I hope. Take not my soul away. Keep me from the snares they set for me and from the stumbling blocks of those who work lawlessness. Sinners shall fall into their own net. I am alone until I escape. So through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ, your God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you everyone for participating. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Good night. All right. Bye, Good ladies. Good night, everybody. Good night. Hi, Jamie. Bye.